Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. Um, so you have liked and even loved the home tour, house tour that I posted uh, about a month ago about the house that we developed in Mar Vista, Los Angeles. So today I am with Ali, my husband and uh, the founder of Sketch Design Development. He developed the house from, the, from scratch and um, there was a whole process, as I mentioned in that video, it took around 18 months and I wanted to discuss a little bit more the process and um, yeah, get some uh, question answered and hopefully it can help you if you have projects to, you know, renovate, buy or anything of that nature. I hope you enjoy it. So welcome to my channel. So, um, Let's start about the, the beginning, when we were looking for a house to buy and flip, not really flip, but um, rebuild from scratch, or a piece of land. I remember that you know we were going to open houses all the time, and then we were looking at certain houses and certain areas, um, and we ultimately chose um, this house that you're gonna see in the screen, um, that we transformed, or that you transformed, actually. <laughs> so, uh, why did you choose that one versus another? Because, uh, you know, mm. you are the professional here. Maybe we should even start by introducing your background. But we'd say related to real estate and property development, you have over 20 to 25 years of experience, most of it in the UK, in London, um, and then you did your contractor's license and real estate license. And you worked for a couple of years here in Los Angeles for very high-end design and build offices where um, you learned a lot and mm. then you decided to um, do your own office, which we are in this office. It's um, Sketch Design Development and it's on um, Sunset Boulevard, right next to actually Selling Sunset, the Oppenheim Group office, it's down the road. So pretty impressive background, if you ask me. <laughs> Uh, first of all, thank you so much for coming down and taking time from your busy schedule to sit down with me and go through uh, the experience we've been through. To answer your question originally, how did I get started? I started studying architecture at university and then after a few years moved on and studied construction management. I realized I liked the design process, but I actually enjoyed the building process more than I do the design process. Or I enjoyed them equally. What people don't understand a lot of times is architecture is purely design. That's all you do, you sit down and you design and then you hand your designs over to someone else to build for you. I really enjoyed the construction process. I decided to study construction management and then went on to start in property development. I spent the last 20 plus years doing property development in the UK. Um, so the question was, how did I get started? Was it? <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> I don't know if it was about Why did you how pick that? you got started Why did or you get... how we picked that yeah, house. Yeah. So how I got started in the property development. Yeah, we can do that and then... Okay, so your first question was how did I pick this site, this location and yeah. how we got started? And ultimately the, the, the answer to that comes to um, your budget and what you want to get started on and what your risk tolerance is. So um, we could have got started on a larger project, but to anyone that's starting in a development project, what I would advise them to do is get started, especially when you're starting in a new location. Begin with a smaller project that you can handle. Despite the fact that I've been involved in property development for many, many years, the US is its own thing. When you move to a new country, you're relying on new architects, new relationships, contractors, subcontractors. There's so many people that are involved in this process that you need to um, create relationships with. So for you to go to a new location and start on a large project is hugely risky. So we started on this smaller scale project. When I say smaller scale, it was a 900 square foot home that we bought and I can go into the budgeting and the financing later if it's something you're interested in or your viewers are interested in. But um, the idea originally was to do an add-on. So we were going to take the 900 square foot home, add about 1,200 square feet and make it about 21, 2200. As we started the process, 
we realized that, you know what, we're better off just tearing the whole thing down because once you get started on a remodeling, it's really, you, you're pretty much going back to the studs of the house. And unless the original features of the house or the size of the house is something that you want to keep, there's no point in keeping what exists. For an extra maybe five or 10% of the entire budget, you build a brand new house. So we decided to tear the whole thing down. Also, when you tear the whole thing down, you then have more architectural freedom. You now can sit down on a plain canvas and design something from the ground up rather than having to work within the restrictions of what already exists. So we tore the whole thing down and then we started the process and it was a, uh, from beginning to end, it was about 18 months. So I have two questions. So you, uh, from my understanding, you chose that property because of the size of the house and the size of the lot. So you could add on, right? Yeah, so I chose that house first and foremost because the budget allowed me to. So our budget to buy something was limited um, or there was a cap on it and we didn't want to jump too big too quickly. So that house fell within the parameters. The area is an up and coming area. Um, and that's why we got started. I knew I wanted to build a house around 25 hundred or three thousand square feet and that fell right within that category it was manageable and it was enough it gave me enough time to be able to build a team so as the projects grow and get bigger then we can do bigger and larger projects and so you said you turned it down but i know that it was legally a renovation because you kept two walls mm. can you tell us more about that sure like, what sure. was the benefit of that sure so in the u.s they have these bizarre rules here in california in particular <laughs> where Technically, a house can be torn down almost entirely. And, and if you keep a couple of the original features, it will be classified as a remodel rather than a tear down and a brand new house. So in this case, we kept two of the walls. One was the wall, which was the garage, and uh, one was the wall that was at the back of the house. The reason why a lot of people choose to do this is you will be working more with the old regulations. So if we were to tear everything down, and rebuild the house ground up today, the wall that exists now at the back where the garage is couldn't be so close to the neighbor's house. There are setbacks. In, in this case, I believe the setback is four or five feet, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so that would have to be torn down and brought in. And then there's also other regulations such as fire sprinklers. If you build a brand new house, you need fire sprinklers. That all adds to the cost of building the house. So therefore, a lot of developers, what they do is they keep a couple of the walls or maybe an original feature, which is the fireplace, and they rebuild the entire house around those two things. That way they have generally a plain canvas, but they don't have to adhere to today's regulations, which are far more stringent than they were 20, 30, 40 years ago. Interesting. Um, okay, so you recommend um, that someone, instead of tearing it down, um, keeping one or two characteristics of the house, mm -hmm. if possible. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I recommend it. It just depends on what you're trying to do and uh, how far you're looking to push. If you have, you know, like I said, in this case, we had walls that were very, very close to the neighbor's wall and um, the setbacks would be too far. So we didn't want to lose that with all, all that additional space. It wasn't worth tearing it down. But in some cases, it is worth tearing the entire house down and starting from ground up. Okay. Also, um, I was very curious to know, um, did you keep the same foundation from the original house? Not sure how foundation works, but is it something that's like forever, the foundation, and then you add on new foundation, so you have to redo the whole thing? Yes, so in this case, the original house was built on a strip foundation. We kept part of it. And again, that's part of the regulations. We'd have to keep part of it. But the, the vast majority, especially the part that we added on, all has new foundations. So part of the house is what's known as strip foundations. And the back end of the house mainly is what's known as a slab, which is you pour the concrete and then you build the house on this new poured concrete. What advice would you give someone or a couple if they want to buy their first house and, you know, maybe renovate it, make it better, add that touch, whether it's to live on it or sell it in the future? What advice would you give them? Uh, the very first advice would be that know what your budget is. Secondly, I would say know your timelines and how long you're willing to wait because these construction and development projects tend to take far longer than you envision. And thirdly, I would say be very, very clear about what you want out of your development or your addition or your remodel. 
before you get started, have a, um, a storyboard or have pictures that you've taken, create something, a visual image of what you want, write down notes, take pictures of anything beautiful that you see, take out cutouts magazine, from magazines or screenshots from your phone, have as clear of a vision as you can before you get started. Yeah, so how does someone know how much they can afford to buy a house or renovate it? What's the first step they should do? Would they, you know, talk to a mortgage broker? Right, I, I think the first step would be to go see a bank. Your local bank will always, almost always, give you the best rates. And usually they want the minimum down in terms of your down payment. However, with some people's earnings, banks can't always help. So you would go to a mortgage broker. Mortgage brokers are far more flexible. So they're able to provide you with different types of loans. One of the loans, for example, is what's known as a DSCR loan. A DSCR loan doesn't take your income into account. What it takes into account is the rental value of the property you're buying. So if it cash flows and you say, I'm going to put this percentage down, I can rent the house for X amount, and that X amount will cover the mortgage, the bank will then lend you on that rather than your personal income. So I remember during this process, there were so many inspections and you were so like stressed. So how much inspection are there in total? Too much. Because I find, I, find it, I find it stressful, that part where there was, oh, there is an inspection on Friday, I have an inspection on Monday. Yeah, yeah. And the, you know, it's, it's kind of stressful. Yeah, uh, there, there is far, far too many inspections if you ask me, but um, but jokes aside, the inspections are really there for the building to be built in a safe way. There are unfortunately a lot of contractors in the business that are going to cut corners. So despite the fact that so many people, including myself, complain about, complain about inspections, ultimately they're designed to help the home builder get the product that the architect designed. Um, so to answer your question, in our project from beginning to end, there must have been around 30 inspections. 30? Yeah. Three zero. Yes. So it was almost every month or every couple of weeks? Yeah, it depends at what stage of the project, but at some stages it can be a couple times a week, other times it can be uh, once every week, every two weeks. Towards the end it starts wow. slowing down, but at some point they're, they're non-stop. And unfortunately with a lot of the inspections, you cannot start the next process of the project until that inspection has passed. So every time you fail an inspection, the project slows down, your subcontractors may disappear and go into other jobs by the time you get them back. Um, you've lost a week or two, so that's why it's really critical that you use a good contractor that doesn't end up losing you time and passes these inspections seamlessly. Yeah, you know, I'm guessing that's what was very, very stressful because from my knowledge, there is no inspection whatsoever in France. Um, where I'm from I've never heard of that maybe there is one or two but I've never heard of that and so I'm guessing um, that's why in California it's very likely that uh, a building uh, a building project takes years and years and years because if you start not getting your inspections and then not rescheduling or not fixing it and not having the people to come and and, and make the process move along it's very easy to fall into like not moving forward. Yeah. yeah, the inspection process is very, very long, even compared to London. There's far, far more inspections. How many in London? Would you say? Um, it, it just it really depends on the kind of project you do, but I would say it's less than half of what you have here. Probably a third of the inspections that you have here. So here it's really, really stringent. You know, in, in some cases I would argue it's a bit too stringent, but you know, it is what it is. You, again, you need to find a good general contractor that can work with the inspector, the city, and just get these these things passed and just keep moving on to the next project. So would you say that you have to build a relationship with the city? Is it always the same person that comes and does the inspection for you? Or is it, mm. how does that work? Is it your subcontractor that yeah. does it? No, so it's actually a really good question. So generally you're assigned with one inspector. Now, that inspector pre pretty much comes about 80% of the times, but there are days where he's going to be off and another inspector comes. How strict are they? At the beginning, they tend to be very strict. So basically what they're trying to do is see whether you know what you're doing. So they'll ask you questions and they'll pick things and th there's all sorts of issues at the beginning that come up. But as they start getting confident in you and they feel like you're a general contractor that knows what you're doing, they, the inspections become easier and easier. So they'll just pop up on site, they'll ask you a couple of questions, they sign and they go because they trust you and they believe. 
that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. So I think as the inspections move on, they do get uh, better. Of course, they, they're checking what they have to do because if anything goes wrong, the city's liable for it. So they're not just going to say, oh, hey, let's have a cup of coffee and, you know, we've been speaking for a few months and I'll just sign the documents and go. No, it's not going to happen like that. But they, they don't pick things non-stop like they do at the very beginning and also to be honest with you it's the luck of the draw sometimes you get really really good inspectors that are very helpful you know even if you do something wrong they would say to you this is the way to correct it or sometimes they'll come and see the way you've done something and they'll, be, they'll, they'll say to you you could have also done it this way it would have saved you some money so some of them are absolutely amazing and then other times unfortunately you get guys that are just almost seems like they don't want to be there on the job they just turn up they're like, sorry, you failed inspections. You say, why? They say, because of this and this. And you say to them, can you explain to me how I can fix it? He's like, it's not my job to tell you. Speak to your architect, speak to your contract, and they walk off. So the majority, I'd like to say, are helpful and good guys, but you do get the guys that are difficult as well. Okay, that's so interesting because it reminds me a little bit of my doing my driver's license in California when I had to do it here. I remember having different inspection inspectors and some of them would not tell me anything and be super rude and some of them they would give me a lesson that would help me for my next one so anyway, it's interesting um, so any tips that you would give someone you know to uh, make sure that the inspection process goes well or smoothly or how to build a relationship or like is there something that you learn oh my gosh I should never do that again or Oh, I should, you know. Yeah, I would say really if you want inspections to go well and you want to build a good relationship with them, make sure that you know what you're doing. That they, they really want to know that the person there is responsible, understands construction. And if there's times where things are out of your understanding or out of your uh, knowledge, it will be advisable to have the person that knows what they're doing there. For example, there was times where the inspector would show up, there were things that were technically quite complicated and then I would have the architect meet me there. I would say, this is gonna be a complicated inspection, please show up so that the inspector, uh, so that if the inspector makes any issues, you're there to answer them. And then when they go back and forth with the architect, architects generally are very, very knowledgeable. All of a sudden, their, their stance changes and they become a lot more uh, relaxed. So I, that's what I would say. And you know, just be friendly and polite and nice to them. They're just doing a job and they have a tough job to do. So most people don't like inspectors. So. So would you say if it's an inspection related to electricity, you have to have the electrician? Or related to plumbing, you have to have to yeah. the plumber? Or is it just better to always have the architect there, like the architect knows everything? No, no, that's, that's also a very good point that you make. So if you have an electrical inspection, make sure that your electrician is there. Same with the plumbing, same with any inspection you have related to a certain trade, make sure that person's there because then when the inspector comes and he's pointing things out, that person is there to understand what he's done wrong. And if he feels like he's done it correctly, he can go back and forth with the inspector. Now, always remember this as well. Inspectors don't know everything. There's been many, many times where the inspectors made mistakes. They turn up and they say, this should be like this. And then we had that example with our electrician and the electrician said, no, that's not the way it is. The code says this. And he said, no, they went back and forth. And he said, okay, I'm gonna go back and double check. And the next day he sent me an email saying, yes, your electrician was correct, you can continue. The codes are constantly changing, so um, the inspectors don't always know absolutely everything, so they also make mistakes. So when you have somebody that knows what they're talking about, that's why it's really, really advisable to have your tradespeople there, because then they can speed up the process. That failed inspection becomes a past inspection. Nice, that's so valuable. Um, and so is there also inspection for renovation or is that just, you know, if it's from scratch? Um, here in LA, unfortunately, if you breathe, there is an inspection <laughs> <laughs> scheduled for that as well. No, but all jokes aside, yes, there is an inspection. Even if you're doing a renovation, pretty much anything and everything you do related to um, a house construction, remodeling, there's an inspection involved. Okay. Having completed this project, what would you say is the one thing that you have learned um, that, you know, you had no idea? Um, I don't know whether I would use I had no idea because I've been doing this so long. I have a general idea of pretty much everything. But you learn things constantly and all the time. 
the, like, like I said, the code is constantly changing. So you're, you're having to learn new codes. There's a code for LID. LID is low impact development, which means um, up to, I believe a year ago, any house that you build, you had to have um, rain barrels to collect the water. So we had that now, the code has changed now. Only homes, I believe over 10,000 square feet need these rain barrels, the same with the solar. Solar power is changing constantly. So there's things that you're learning and also with the construction process, here in the US is timber-based timber construction. In the UK and Europe is mainly masonry, so it's brick, block, cement. So that's something that was different that I had to get my head around. But you know, I've been doing it long enough that the process is pretty much the same. Ultimately, what it comes down to is you're using different subcontractors. Here in the US, you use framers that do um, uh, timber frame construction. So that's, that's yeah. And so what would you say was the high and lows of this process in your eyes? It's really difficult because there's so many highs and lows. Of course, when you first purchase the property, that's your first high. When you start demoing the property, that's another high. When you finally get the plans approved by the city, that's another high. So there's a lot of highs. And also when you finish the project, it's a high as well. You finally, 12, 13, 14 months of hard, hard work has come to an end and it's done. At that point, it's actually bittersweet because you're also sad the project's completed and in a lot of cases you end up selling the house or renting the house. So it's, it almost feels like an end of a relationship. And, um, and on the low side, I have to tell you, it's usually people. It's people letting you down. Um, or it's difficulties with the city where one person at the city says something and then someone else some, says something else. But I would say probably the main thing with the lows is when your subcontractors let you down. When someone says they're going to show up on this day and they don't show up. That's a low because you're relying on people and you trust people and they let you down. Or if someone says they're going to do a work to a certain standard and they don't. And then you have to go back. So I think the relationship parts are the parts that are the most stressful, especially if you have a long-term relationship and how you manage that. You know, if you, someone that says some, they're going to do something and they don't within a certain period of time, but you have a long-term relationship with them, you can't always go to battle with people. You have to be diplomatic. Um, so they're, they're the parts where sometimes you kind of get fed up, you come home and you're like, I'm done. But then you always go to sleep, wake up the next day and you just new burst of energy and you go for it again. The construction development proce process is ultimately a, a marathon. It's not a sprint. Mm -hmm. When you do the sprint, there's always points where you get tired, but then you go to sleep, you wake up the next day and you go again. But you just have to look at it as a 12 month process, 15 month process, and you just go through the ups and downs. But you know, ultimately the reason why we do what we do because there's far more highs than lows. Mm -hmm. And do you think it's doable for someone to do it if they have another full-time job on the side and you, you said you recommend them to, right? Uh, I, no, you could definitely do it. it. It really depends on the scale of what you want to do. And also it depends on your budget. So with smaller scale projects, the issue is you don't have the financial budget in order to be able to hire someone to manage it for you. So that the responsibility falls on you. So now if you have a full-time job and you have to manage a crew of people and these guys are showing up on site, but you can't make it to site Monday to Friday from nine till five, it's very difficult to manage it. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to hire a site superintendent, you don't have the budget. A site superintendent typically charges anywhere from eighty to one hundred twenty thousand a year, depending on the experience. If you're doing a small remodel or even a small ground up, there isn't a budget for a site superintendent. So you're relying on your contractor. As your budget gets more and more, you then hire a project manager, and those project managers can take a huge amount of responsibility off you. And I would advise anyone that's getting into larger scale projects to hire a project manager. The amount of time, headache, stress they will save you and ultimately money. the money. Yes, because people always, they're short-sighted. They look at a project manager and think, for example, it's gonna cost me 100,000 a year. But when you're doing a, a development project that's $2 million, believe me, that's the best 100,000 you could spend, especially when you have someone that's experienced. They know which subcontractors to use. They know where to buy materials from to save you money. They know where to save you time. Sometimes they have relationship with inspectors because they've worked in that city. So I would advise anyone, unless you want a nervous breakdown, to manage one of these larger projects. I'm joking. Unless you want extra stress in your life, which you don't need, um, I, would I would definitely um, advise you hiring somebody that can manage the project for you.
I was gonna say I, I also um, really liked um, the design decisions uh, or the design aspect that you brought to the house like whether it's the facade um, you know like these lines that are like the sketch logo or like the wood panels and the doors um, I, I guess it takes courage to have a design in mind and do it in a house and I still love it so much it's it's really nice so I don't know I find it's not I don't think everyone can just think that you know a design is nice and then just go with it so what would you say to someone that you know doesn't know if they should take a risk like that. Yeah. If you have design ideas, like I mentioned earlier, I would put them down or in a format which you can follow. And I would also, one mistake people make is that they pick individual things. They'll pick a sofa and then they'll pick a color and then they'll pick the wooden flooring and they'll pick the vanity unit in the kitchen or set a vanity unit and they pick the vanity unit in the bathroom. Um, and they pick all of these things based on individually liking them. But what they don't think about is when all of these things come together, is there a cohesive design to it? Do these things match? Do the colors match? And that's where you see a lot of, uh, um, and that's where you see it. That's where you see a lot of designs that don't quite look right. However, having said that, so much of design is subjective. It's it's depending. It really depends on what you like. And in our situation, most of the time we're designing for an end user. So we're looking to design something that somebody's going to like. So the less specific you can make it and you can make it uh, appeal to a wider audience, the better it is. So what advice would you give uh, related to the interior design since you were um, involved in that aspect? Yeah, so we've done the interior design in-house. Um, we do pretty much everything. We do the architecture, interior design and construction all in-house. And thanks to you, we actually done some really, really good uh, additional features within the house you're really really great and the advice i would give someone for the interior design aspect of a house is get started very very early on a mistake that is common when people are doing development projects is they wait for the construction of the house to finish and then they start thinking about the interior the interior is really a, a part of the architectural design also so i would get an interior designer involved at the architectural stage so that everything works well with the design of the art one of the things that you did help me with was when we were trying to choose the stone for the countertop and backsplash in the kitchen. Uh, I took you to that showroom. We looked at a couple that I was, I was kind of fixed on one of the two options. You came in and you said to me, no, you don't think it's going to look good. So we did end up changing the stone to something else because of your opinion. Okay. And it looks terrible. <laughs> no, yeah, okay. Okay, nice. Um... One of my uh, followers on Instagram, by the way, follow me on Instagram. Um, and if you have any additional questions, you can always DM me uh, or comment under this video. So, you know, we can uh, keep going with this type of content if you enjoy it. Um, but one of my followers said that they thought that we were going to move into the house. Um, so what do I have to say about that? I feel like I'm being put under the spot. <laughs> So I stop laughing, I'm trying to talk to your audience. <laughs> so yeah, no, so I feel like I am actually being put on the spot now. I don't like this uh, question okay. at all. But seriously, all jokes aside, uh, there was plans to move in, but there's always this question when you do property development um, of do I move into this property that I love and I really, really want to move into or do I take the money and move on to another project and keep building up um, the, the financials that you have in order to be able to do bigger and larger projects and then move into a bigger and nicer house later down the line. So there's always that decision to make. But at the moment, we are still swinging back and forth between do we move in, do we sell it, or do we rent it, do we hold on to it? So let's see. It's a beautiful house. I do like it. And, you know, we designed it from beginning to end. You helped stage it and picked a lot of the features in there. So it's definitely one of the special ones. And uh, also, what is for you? So in real estate, I love real estate. Um, there is a few uh, aspects of a house or a property, such as a garage, a backyard, a pool, a new build. What for you is the number one criteria of your dream house? 
um, number one criteria. There's so many that you could pick from, but if I had to pick one aspect of a house that really makes me feel like this is the place I want to live, I love a house where you walk into an open space. And I like this feeling of your living room, your kitchen, your dining area all being combined and creating this space that as soon as you walk into the house, you have this grand opening. I do not like walking into a house and entering through corridors and everything breaks off corridors and creates this compartmentation within the house. That, yeah. You know, I would have not thought that you would answer that. Mm, mm, I usually wouldn't, but I'm trying to sell the house. <laughs> 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 okay so there's no but it's true there, there, there is no but there, no so so yeah so um, uh, so okay let's say three three most okay, important criteria three most important quite for a house are, are we talking about my personal house or are we yeah, talking about personal, if i'm developing your, something no, for somebody personal for you to move in for me so my on. my personal house would be one would be the entrance and how you walk into the house i love walking in and walking into a big open space I don't like walking into house. I don't like walking into a house where you enter through a corridor and everything starts breaking off that corridor. That's number one. Number two would be I love outdoor spaces. So I'd want a house with a backyard and any kind of usable outdoor space. So it's, it's essential for me. Here in Los Angeles, you see homes, you walk in, and despite the fact the house is a nice home and it's a nice size, it literally has no backyard. Um, or some of them are literally on the street. So yeah. That I don't like. Um, and then the third thing I would say is I like the idea of off-street parking. I like to drive my car onto my drive and enter the house rather than leaving the car on the street. These are a couple Maybe of things I like. That house would be perfect for I us. know, I know. And for you, what's the three aspects of a home that you would love and would make you want to move into it? So for me, um, I, at least the top one is a new build. Um, because I just find that the energy of the space is so clean. It, there is no like past history or older walls or like lower ceilings or anything like that. So I would say that the new build um, is something that I realized I really love. It feels very peaceful, very clean. I really love that. Mm. I also love high ceilings. Um, and then one more? One more? Oh, that's hard to, to actually tell because Can I answer for you? just say one. Can I yes, answer for you? please do. In your kitchen. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> huh? That's like your dream answer for me. <laughs> but it's true. Maybe it's not oh. the kitchen. No, I'm joking. Kevin, every it's time she's like, kitchen. every time she's in the I kitchen in Biona, she's like, if Actually, I had a nice kitchen, I would be in there all the time and cooking. So <laughs> you've been lying to me, huh? Actually, you know, when we when I went into the house and I opened that like kitchen, like fridge and everything, like I felt something. Yeah. Like what? Like this this fridge will always be empty and we'll be taking away. No, I I felt like um like it was gonna be heartbreaking to part with it. The fridge. The house. Okay. Yeah. So what if someone has no savings and no jobs, <laughs> but they want to build a house and live in a luxury home? Ensure, <laughs> <laughs> ensure they, 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 they can't. <laughs> oh, okay. So another one. So what would you say is the number one? advice that you would give someone that wants to start a business whatever field it would be uh, the number one advice i would give someone that wants to start a business is be very clear in terms of what your business is uh, they say make a mission statement or create a mission statement and i would say do that for your business as well so there's so many people that have ideas of what they want their business to be but they don't really know what that business is. And then once you've got the idea of the business and what it is that the business is going to do, then the next step is to break down the individual steps that will get you there and work towards step-by-step step, incrementally over a, a sustained period of time. One of the things that people do, they look at an entire business 
and it becomes so overwhelming because there's so many things to do to get this business off the ground they don't know where to start and they become lost but if you sit down and just break that business into individual parts and just give yourself time give yourself a month two months to sit down and put it together i, I don't believe any business is that difficult to do and um what would you say if someone finds it hard to choose between um few different business ideas or ambitions like how would they go about choosing one i would sit down and write all the things that i want to do and all the ambitions that i have and i would you could have five ten fifteen and i would pick one or two of them and i would give myself a set amount of time and i would work towards them non-stop so i want to start a online business i want to do this and i want to do that Pick online business and if you want something else. And two things that don't clash with each other. Maybe sometimes these things can also work together. And I would spend six months purely focusing on that. And at the end of that six months, you'll get a good idea of whether you think this is going to work or not. If it looks like it's going to work, you continue along the process. If you think at the end of six months, because you learn a lot along the way, you have some visions and ideas of what a business is, but you don't know what it's like until you get started. After three months, six months a year, it depends on different businesses, you'll figure it out. If it looks like something that you want to continue, you continue. If you don't, you cross it out on your list and you move on to one of the other ambitions you've got. But you need to do them and move on. So many people have five, six, ten ideas. They want to do all of them and they end up doing none of them because you cannot do five things, five things at the same time. So just pick one or two, ideally one. You want to put all your focus on one, but you can get away with two and just get started great well thank you so much for your time you are very welcome my dear wife please feel free to come in here and question me again anytime you like okay thank you so much for watching please subscribe like the video leave a comment and let us know if you want a part two bye